Coming up on Capital Crossfire, the final stretch of the midterm elections loom, Hurricane Fiona leaves Puerto Rico in its wake, and the future of the Republican Party remains in question. Joining us today, we have Ethan Kerr, and I'm your moderator, Alina Fias. From the GWTV studios in Washington, D.C., this is Capital Crossfire. We are just under six weeks away from Election Day and polls have been narrowing. Key battleground states like Georgia and Arizona have gained national attention on the slate of candidates. Amid rising tensions over climate change and inflation, the stakes of this election have never been higher. Ethan, Democrats have been catching up to Republicans in key races and are say, eyeing chances of holding both chambers. What do you think has caused this shift and what does this shift signify about the voter base ahead of the midterm elections this fall? Well, I would like to first iterate that if you look at the candidates that Republicans have brought up, most of them are becoming these, you know, ultra-right, you know, neoconservative MAGA Republicans, mm. right? So you're not seeing your, you know, grandfather's Republican Party. You're not seeing the party of Ronald Reagan. You're not seeing the party of Lincoln. You're seeing this new, you know, neoconservative, anti-real American values, if you want to be quite specific. Um, rise in the ranks of the Republican Party. So this, I think, is going to be, is changing the political landscape for Democrats come the election. And I think we're going to see Democrats actually do better than expected because most voters don't like Trump. I think that is a uh, underrepresented fact. He w lost the election specifically because of what he ran on and who he was. Most people value America, value freedom, value democracy, and this is what the party is not running for anymore. So I think in states like Arizona or in Florida, you're seeing them starting to become more content, um, start being favored for Democrats, especially look in Georgia, for example, or even in uh, Pennsylvania where uh, Dr. Oz is in, and his, uh, mm -hmm. you know, really doesn't live in Pennsylvania. He lives in New Jersey, but he doesn't. Right. But I think those kind of candidates are not um, what we're seeing the most of Americans have value. Okay. And Ethan, with Democrats bouncing back, what issues should each party focus on or shed additional light on strategically before this election? Well, I think that we see Republicans trying to take away the rights of citizens, you know, whether it's, you know, having the right to go what's inside your body and how you should actually live your life. Um, you're taking away the rights of people's, you know, talking about is gay marriage Absolutely acceptable? Not. This is something that hasn't, you know, was settled law, you know, collectively decided. Even 50% of Republicans agree gay marriage and same-sex marriage should be legal in this country, and yet we're still seeing that freedom being possibly taken away. Mm. So we're seeing these, you know, freedoms and these rights that Americans have held dear taken away, and that should be front and center. Plus, with climate change going on, um, Republicans are again pro, you know, the world, the planet, our own lives, and they're very against American values, so I think we're taking away that away. Mm. Inflation numbers were higher than expected in August, but still decreased because of rapidly declining gas prices. Democrats have tried to veer away from inflation as a talking point, while Republicans continue to capitalize upon it. Ethan, in light of skyrocketing inflation, the Fed has raised interest rates to three quarters of a percentage point for the third time this year and could lead to a tightening of the economy and rising unemployment rates. Do you think the GOP can capitalize upon this and find inroads among more moderate and voters and even Democrats? Well, in regards to inflation, I think we're forgetting that this is not just a U.S. issue. You know, it's not just the Democrats in control. If it was true, then why are we seeing the conservatives in Britain, you know, struggle with inflation? Mm. They are having the same problems the Bank of England just raised their um, interest rates as well. So it's not just a democratic thing, it's a global phenomenon that affected all of us. With the war going on in Ukraine, you have still, you know, supplies being left in harbors and whatnot due to the COVID pandemic, still str China struggling. Um, and that is one of the big causes of inflation. In regards to unemployment, you know, over 8 million jobs were created by uh, President Biden and his plans, and we're seeing the labor market stay so strong and that unemployment is, numbers are so low that this is going to continue to keep American because the backbone of America is the American workers, and that's mm. what's keeping our economy afloat, and keeping our economy strong is because of the American workers. One key governor has taken center stage this midterm election, and he's not even in a competitive race. 
Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has sent migrants from South and Central America to predominantly Democratic states just a mere six weeks away from Election Day, with one of the latest stunts taking place in Martha's Vineyard. Ethan, many on both sides of the aisle have criticized DeSantis for turning people into political pawns, while others think it's drawing justified attention to the border crisis. Do you believe this is a good strategy for the GOP, or are they shooting themselves in the foot? Well, I would say, as someone from Massachusetts, mm. Um, I know our governor has said, you know, we're sanctuary state, you know, Boston sanctuary city. We're going to take them in. You know, this country is built on immigrants. We are Americans. We're all, you know, vowing as, you know, the son of a first generation immigrant. That's what the American dreams for. And so we have, in Massachusetts, example, we've accepted them. We're giving them food, shelter. We're actually, you know, pairing them to try to uh, adjust them into the U.S., mm -hmm. get them citizenship in their papers. Um, and it's funny, too, because Ron DeSantis doesn't even want to talk about how the increase in Cub illegal Cubans have come into Florida just a few months ago, and yet there is no word from him of trying to get rid of those Cuban immigrants because Cubans are a prime voter for his base. So I think he's really picking and choosing who he decides to send over and which pawns he likes to play in his political chess game. And I think it's unfair. We shouldn't be using people as value. You know, Humans are what makes America great. Immigrants are what makes America, America. And so we should be welcoming them with open arms. We should help them get documentation. Yes, we should you know, stop criminals from coming in. However, people who want to come work, you know, experience the American dream, they should be able to come here and allow them to prosper as most of our ancestors did. 40% of Americans can trace their you know, lineage back to Ellis Island. And I think that's what we should be talking about and how we should help people not try to ship them across the country because mm. it's politically, you know, savvy. Ethan, we also know DeSantis is eyeing a bid for the White House in 2024. Are Democrats only feeding into the DeSantis machine before he announces a potential run? I think, you know, I can't predict the future. If mm. I could, I think I would uh, do be really good in, uh, as a pollster. But <laughs> um, I think DeSantis is trying to bid for the Republican nomination. I see this you know, with Trump, his possible going into, he might be in prison in that time, mm. he could be indicted, he might not be able to run. So I think he's trying to edge himself for the presidency. And you know, if they want to send another, you know, anti-America candidate up, that's fine with us. We'll be able to show our strength and our support by the American people and how much people support our policies and for, uh, ready to face whoever candidate. And that will be the last word. Up next, Rapid Fire, we'll be right back. Raise high. This isn't just our battle cry. It's our call, our challenge. Because when you were called to Washington, you were called to higher expectations, to a higher standard. We are called here to advance knowledge, to serve society, to change the world. Is that too lofty, too aspirational? Is it simply too much to expect? Not if your classroom is a Smithsonian, the IMF, or on the doorstep of the Supreme Court. Not if you have access to the most hallowed institutions and formidable leaders. Not if you are given the tools to change minds, shape laws, influence entire fields of study, advance our way of life, change the course of history. From the nation's capital to the four corners of the earth, to far below the surface and far beyond our atmosphere, here unique opportunities the ones that many people work much of their lives to get are within your reach from the moment you arrive this is where you find new pathways for preventing global epidemics where your unexpected friend propels a new scientific movement forward this is where you push forward as a team to break records and reach new heights where your classroom is 68 square miles of the most consequential land on earth this is where you will make it happen. This is the George Washington University, and what we make is history. So stand up, be bold, take risks, press on, push harder, raise high. Welcome back to Rapid Fire. Some quick answers to some quick questions. Up first, Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico. Hurricane Fiona has devastated Puerto Rico and left many without power or clean drinking water. While the hurricane was ravaging the island, President Biden was attending the state funeral for Queen Elizabeth in London. 
President Trump came under fire for his careless response to Hurricane Maria back in 2017, almost exactly five years ago, and many are calling hypocrisy upon Biden for his lackluster response. Ethan, with Biden being in London while the hurricane made landfall, what messages does it send to Puerto Rico and what implications does this have for his overall approval rating? Well, first I would like to say that it's a very tragic uh, thing that happened in Puerto Rico. Um, the, the humanitarian cost is, is very tragic and I think we need to really have a conversation about why is this keeping happening, how can we prevent it, and how we can move forward. So to answer your first question, I think, um, you know, this ca definitely caught us all off guard. Um, you know, the president being away on, you know, his stately duties. So I think um, that doesn't, the optics aren't great, but unfortunately that's just the reality of what we are in. Mm. However, I think moving forward, um, the people of Puerto Rico need to be getting the support that they need from Congress. We need to be really sending in FEMA and other congressional aid to make sure this happens and also to prevent it in the future, right? We're seeing, you know, this mishandling um, within the governorship we're in Puerto Rico. We're seeing this mishandling of the Congress not allowing them to have the rights as American citizens. I think that's also another thing. Mm -hmm. um, if the people of Puerto Rico want to be a state, they should become a state. If they want to remain a territory, they should remain a territory. And that will allow them to have more inter, um, interactions with trade, allow them more interactions with economics, which can help prevent these futures, sorry, these hurricanes from happening in the future because it gives them more cushion with economic resources. So I think in the meantime, I think Biden and the president and Congress should be sending more um, aid and allowing it to be structured so it can build their you know, infrastructure from um, the electrical to uh, the physical infrastructure like roads and bridges and allow that to boost forward. Actually, the, um, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, part of this will be going to that. So I think this is an extra um, benefit to the Puerto Ricans, but unfortunately the humanitarian loss is something that we can never really get back. President Biden left his COVID-19 team scrambling when he said in a recent 60 Minutes interview that the pandemic is, quote, over. Cases are still averaging thousands per day and deaths are still widely reported. Ethan, do you think it's responsible for Biden to be making such a stark claim on television despite there being an emergency COVID declaration in around 10 states? Well, I think the president, you know, has said we're going to follow the science, which we are. We're, you know, the party of science. We're forward thinking and based on what is relevant at the time and as of right now if you look at the deaths as you mentioned they're all from people who do not have um, their vaccinations or booster shots um, which is free from the government the government has said if you want it you can take it we're not going to force this on you but if you want those vaccines if you want those booster shots you can receive it you know we've given out you know masks and PPE for free we've given out testing for free we've given the states and the people all they want it's all up to the individuals now mm. right you know America is, you know, individualistic and we're trying to build, you know, people collective so they can build the communities, right? People don't want to follow the signs and people don't want to sign. That's their responsibility. Fortunately, you know, I'm vaccinated. I'm here. That's why we're able to have this, you know, mask right. off. Um, and I think that's what we should be doing, following the signs, giving people the tools and the, um, and the responsibility to do what's right and for their needs. And that's what the president has done. So I think the president saying that the pandemic's over is following the signs. You know, if you look at those deaths, they're all unvaccinated. So follow the science. That's what we've been doing. The January 6th committee has announced a new hearing set for September 28th, and Ginny Thomas, wife of Justice Clarence Thomas, agreed to testify in front of Congress, potentially sending shockwaves through Washington and across the country. Ethan, as you know, Liz Cheney lost her primary election by a fairly wide margin after taking leadership on this January 6th committee. What does this imply for the future of the Republican Party, in your opinion? Well, like I said earlier, this MAGA Republican, you know, um, anti, clearly anti-American because if they aren't willing to stand up to, you know, the men and women who assaulted the Capitol, you know, our Constitution, our country, you know, kill, even killing Capitol Police, this idea of protectionism and keeping Americans safe is totally redundant because of this. You know, this was a very tragic day in American history. We need to make sure people who have committed the crimes are put away and have their justice and make sure that justice is served to every single person in committee, whether that's the former president, whether even if that's a Supreme Court justice's mm. spouse, that needs to happen, right? And just because we have people stand up for America, they should not be punished. And I think it's a shame we see um, with Liz Cheney, 
this is a clear indication that the MAGA Republican has the party by control and that they are forcing this un-American, unpatriotic values to this country and people need to be having justice in their day in court. Well, so you mentioned Jenny Thomas. What do you think we can expect from her in this hearing? Well, I think we're gonna, it's going to be interesting because we're going to see her role in it. We know she was there in the Capitol. To what extent, we're not sure. And she should be also prosecuted for that. Just because you're married to someone, um, that privilege should not extend mm -hmm. to that. I think if there is a reason for her to, um, to be arrested or to go be indicted, she should be doing so. And I think the January 6th has allowed us to see the full scope of what's going on from the beginning to the end and allowing us as Americans to judge valuely and for what those are valued for. Well said. And that will wrap up our first Capital Crossfire episode of the semester. Ethan Kerr, thank you so much for joining me on the show. When we come back, Sydney has your fact check. Universities like George Washington play a critical role in hosting debate and discourse on events of the day. The right answer is not to refuse the other. The right answer is not to say, get rid of this religion. It's not part of us. It's wrong. I think that the story of America is a story of race. So when I think of the questions that I'm asking or the stories that I'm going to write, I'm thinking, OK, well, what are we learning about our country? Well, I think the likelihood of him being indicted is, is close to 100%. There was a lot of hurdles that had to be cleared in order for that to happen. One of the reasons that Donald Trump is president is because there is such a frustration with the way that Washington functions. Sympathy is one thing, but empathy is the language of recovery, and it's something that's without a doubt instilled into every person that's in recovery. It's never lead with the positive, it's always lead well, with I, the perceived negative. Well, I, that, is, that is part of the problem. I mean, I actually would agree with you on that. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, one of the things that we have seen that is most under siege in this country is the notion of civil discourse, and we here at GW, among other things, very much want to stand for that. This is truly an only at GW moment. Welcome back. During my discussion with Ethan, a team of our fact checkers monitored our debate. Sydney Schmidt is here to tell us what we missed. Sydney? Thanks, Selena. Our guests came prepared to today's discussion with few errors. However, a few clarifications should be made. Ethan Kerr claimed that Massachusetts governor declared the state a sanctuary for migrants. However, Governor Charlie Baker has said the opposite beginning in 2017. Massachusetts has no sanctuary law on the books, although several cities and towns, including Cambridge and Concord, have sanctuary status. As a small misconception, our debater claimed that unemployment numbers are down. While this is technically true and unemployment has been trending down, a report released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on September 2nd showed that unemployment increased 0.2% from 3.5% in July to 3.7% in August. Ethan also asser asserted that all COVID deaths come from people who aren't vaccinated or boosted. This is false. While unvaccinated and unboosted Americans are certainly more at risk of severe illness or death from COVID, only 67% of COVID deaths can be attributed to unvaccinated Americans. Well, that's all for this episode of Capital Crossfire. Be sure to check us out online at gw-tv.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. For all of us at GW TV, I'm Alina Fayez. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you back here next time.